classroom and laboratory to the field. It provides one of the finest study and research environments on the African continent and is recognized internationally as a center of excellence. Agriculture, Engineering and Science is one of four colleges that make up the University of KwaZulu-Natal and is home to over 8,700 students and approximately 700 staff. Three of the university's five campuses form the core of agriculture, engineering and science activities in the region. The college comprises five schools, Agricultural Earth and Environmental Sciences, Engineering, Chemistry and Physics, Life Sciences and Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Science. Engineering is offered on the Howard College campus, Agriculture on the Peter Maritzburg, and all the other sciences on both the Peter Maritzburg and Westfield campuses. Exceptions are Agricultural Engineering, which is offered in Peter Maritzburg, and Geology, which is offered at Westville only. To compete with the best and to meet the challenges of the 21st century, South Africa needs highly skilled professionals in the areas of agriculture, engineering and science. We offer a wide array of interesting and innovative degree programs that open doors to a variety of different careers. Some degrees are unique to UKZN and are not offered at other tertiary institutions. For example, we are the only university in South Africa to offer a fully accredited agricultural engineering degree and one of only two universities in the country to offer a BSc in land surveying. Our postgraduate food security training program is the only one in the world and we have the widest range of agricultural disciplines at any single South African or African campus. The choices of degree and the options on offer may seem confusing at first. Engineering degrees are more specific and the options are usually career focused. Emphasis is placed on training in the specific principles which engineers deal with in their professions. Engineering offers seven different professional specializations. There are also degrees in land surveying or geomatics and property development. In science, they are structured or career focused degrees. These include fields as varied as chemical technology, marine biology, industrial and applied biotechnology, and computer science and information technology, to mention a few. There are also more general degrees with a lot of flexibility. In this case, students have the choice of studying a BSc stream in maths, physics, computer science, and statistics. All of these have a strong mathematical component. The other option is a BSc LES stream with a focus on the life and environmental sciences with subjects such as geography, genetics, botany, hydrology, zoology, ecology, and microbiology. In agriculture, there are various different options that involve practical and scientific applications. Students can combine science subjects with specific agricultural disciplines for a four-year Bachelor of Science in Agriculture degree. These are more career orientated. Agriculture and agricultural management are three-year degrees with a higher practical component. Dietetics is a professional qualification that deals with the role nutrition plays in the promotion of health and the treatment of disease. Most degree programs across the college have field trips and projects that contribute significantly to the curriculum. This ensures that students learn in real-life situations under full field conditions. Many of our lecturers have received 
excellence in teaching awards, are recognized internationally and are rich in practical experience. Students have access to excellent facilities that rank amongst the best in the world. 300 million rands has recently been invested in new teaching and research facilities, state-of-the-art laboratories and improved equipment. The 30 million rands new School of Engineering building is the envy of engineering campuses across the country. Agricultural students have access to a 356 hectare research and training farm situated near the Peter Maritzburg campus. This facility provides students with hands-on training and is used extensively as an outdoor laboratory for teaching and research in areas such as animal and poultry science, horticultural science and agricultural engineering. Adjoining Ukulinga is the Bisley Valley Nature Reserve which supports the diversity of plant and bird species as well as some large mammals. It provides a rich learning and research environment for staff and students. Based on the Westville campus, the college possesses unique facilities for research into higher voltage power transmission. These facilities are available in only three other places in the world and form part of the Eskom-sponsored Science and Technology Innovation Park. The Science and Technology Education Centre showcases the college's scientific achievements and promotes the public understanding of science, engineering and technology within the region. The college houses a wide range of sophisticated equipment in its microscopy and microanalysis units, staffed by highly qualified and skilled technical specialists. The College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science prides itself on its graduates who are highly sought after. In a market characterized by a shortage of qualified professionals in science and technology, our graduates are readily employed around the world in the fields of agriculture, science, commerce, industry, engineering and research, to name just a few. Research plays a major role within the college and operates at the cutting edge of technology. College has the highest research output in the university and produces the most research publications. There are over 60 well-established research groups and centers within the college. The African Center for Crop Improvement caters for Good morning, students, and welcome to our third um, biology metric helpline session this morning. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that uh, this session is going to be uh, helpful to you. We're going to be dealing with paper two, which you write on Monday. So I suppose you'll be taking today and tomorrow to um, study for your paper two. Uh, if there are any grade 11s, I'm not sure if you are writing as well, your paper two, I'm not sure when that would be, but if you are here, you may, uh, you may put any questions that you have in the chat and my colleague, Dr. Namisha Singh will assist you. Uh, also, Matrix, if you have any questions as I'm going along, please feel free to ask me. You can unmute and ask me as we go along, or you can also put it in the chat, okay? Um, uh, Dr. Sting will help you in the chat as well. And if you just need any quick question, if you just have any quick questions, she can answer them for you in the chat. Um, but please feel free to, to ask me any questions as I'm going. And if you need me to explain anything further, please feel free to ask me, okay? I don't mind. I will stop and, and explain to you. Okay, I'm just going to get straight into the PowerPoint this morning. And I'm just going to share my screen. 
quickly. Okay, can everybody see that? You can just give me a thumbs up. If you can see a PowerPoint screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, can I just ask uh, Naomika if you'll be able to please just admit the people in the waiting room? Um, I'll just, I prefer to start when they, they are in. Okay, I've been admitting them. They're all in so far. There's no all one right. from the waiting room. Thank you. Okay. Okay, students. So um, this is our first session for paper two. And the session is going to be uh, comprising of your main topic for your paper two, which is evolution. And that is going to be for 54 marks. Okay. From your total of 150. So it's about one third of your paper. Okay, so it's quite a big section. And if I have time, I'm going to try and go through some meiosis uh, very quickly. It is one of the easier sections. I mean, you've been doing it since grade 10. So you should really be familiar and totally comfortable with this topic. But we will um, just go over it just to refresh your memory. Okay, so that would be another 21 marks from your paper two. Okay, and it should be 21 marks that you are guaranteed to get. Okay, so let's not lose any marks on the easy section, uh, like meiosis, um, because it's very easy for you to learn off and you've been exposed to it for the last two years already. Okay, so let's, let's aim for getting everything correct for meiosis. Okay, the questions in the exam uh, papers that I will be showing you, you'll see for, for meiosis, it's absolutely easy. Um, there, there's only a set number of things that they can ask about meiosis. And similar thing for evolution, it's just that you may get some application questions uh, for this evolution section. Okay, but all the, the questions that we're gonna go through today, I've taken from past papers uh, from 2016 to 2020. Okay. So we're going to go through them and you're welcome to ask me any questions as we go in. Okay, so let's jump straight into the first one. Okay, we're going to start with evolution. Okay, and we're going to start with the theory of evolution and um, natural selection and that topic before we go on to human evolution. Okay. So this question is from 2017 and it's, uh, there's a few topics in evolution that you should definitely know, okay? So this particular question deals with uh, speciation, which is a topic that you must be able to uh, uh, understand and answer questions on because you're definitely going to get a type of question for or dealing with speciation, okay? It's a, it's a main theme of evolution, obviously. Okay, so this question is, uh, a mutation occurred within the population of squirrels. The population was then separated by a river. Many years later, it was discovered that the original population had, had <clears throat> excuse me, undergone speciation. The process of speciation is shown in the diagram below. Okay, so you can see that this species A and uh, eventually there's a species B, okay? So this original uh, species A you can, is represented by these plain uh, non-colored in circles. And there were some individuals that had a different or a mutation in the population. So the, these two squares are your, still your original squirrel population. But you can see that there's some mutation occurred in some individuals. And so now we've got this sort of mixed population of uh, squirrels, okay? 
And over time, they actually separated on either side of this river. Okay, so that the fact that there's a river in this question must set off alarm bells for you. And you're going to think of some sort of geographical barrier that is preventing or that is going to separate these two populations. Okay, so let's start with the question. Define a population. Definitions are extremely important. Okay, so you uh, are more than welcome to uh, please unmute your mic and just answer as we going along. Um, because obviously I know all of these answers. So it's up to you to actually see whether you can answer these, these questions. So if anybody can unmute and let me know what is the definition of a population. And it's an easy two marks to get. Anybody? Ma'am, it's a group of organisms that have the same yes. characteristics. Sorry, what was the last part of what you said? Ma'am, it's, it's a group of organisms that have a common um, characteristics. Okay, so that is, that is correct. And can anybody add to that? Anybody want to add anything to that definition? So they have common characteristics, that's true. So it's a group of individuals, okay? And they're usually of the same species, okay? So there's a number of things you need to sort of highlight in this definition, okay? So it's a group of individuals of the same species that form a breeding unit, okay? So if they can interbreed, then they are the same species and they are in one population, okay? and they occupy the same habitat. Okay, so it's a bit more in depth than just a, a group of individuals with the same characteristics. They have to occupy the same habitat and they have to be the same species and they have to be able to interbreed. Okay, so those three components now is going to give you your full marks for the definition of a population. Okay, is that clear? Understandable. You can just uh, unmute and give me a thumbs up or anything. Okay. The next question, other than mutations, give three causes of variation in a population. This is a very important question. You're definitely going to get tested on the sources of variation. Okay, so what are the sources of, of variation? Let me just add in some answers here for you as well as we're going along. Okay, so who can tell me so three sources of variations of variation in a population other than a mutation? Think Random about it. Yes. Random arrangement. Of what? Of chromosome. Where? At the equator. Very good. Okay, so you see I want that full sentence so that you make sure you get that mark. Okay, random assortment of chromosomes on the equator during metaphase. Okay, what other main source of variation? I'll give you a clue. It's in meiosis. No. Crossing over. Very yeah. good. What else? Random mating. Very good. Anything else? Random fertilization. Random fertilization. Very good. Okay, so you guys are on the right track. Yeah, I'm just putting in some answers for you in case you want to jot those down. Okay. okay. And like you, some of us have to learn to get A's. Okay, if I can just ask you to mute your mic for me when you're done answering the question. Okay, so crossing over, we said random assortment, mating, 
and fertilization. All right. Okay. Okay, so explain why they are, uh, there were eventually more squirrels in the mutation, with the mutation on one side of the river. This is also something that you are likely to get, to get asked. And it, if I give you a clue, it has to do with natural selection. There's going to be a central theme of natural selection. So you'll be asked about natural selection in, in different instances. You're going to get, uh, for 54 marks, you're probably going to get two or three uh, application type of questions for evolution. And you're likely to get overlap in terms of um, how you apply the theory of natural selection. Okay, so explain why there were eventually more squirrels with the mutation on one side of the river. How come there were more, more squirrels with the mutation compared to those without? Obviously, this mutation gave the squirrels some sort of advantage, some sort of favorable characteristic, and that allowed them to survive. Okay, and if they are going to survive, it means that they're going to be able to pass their, that gene and, and that mutation on to the next generation. They're going to breed and, and the next generation are going to receive that mutation as well, which will give them an advantage for survival. Okay, so that mutation allowed them to uh, adapt or survive better in those environmental conditions on this side of the river. Okay, so then those uh, characteristics were passed on to future generations. Okay, so you must definitely be able to, to, to explain something like this. Okay, it's usually for three or so marks. Okay, let me just make this a bit smaller so we can see the last question. Okay, explain what effect the process above has on the biodiversity of an ecosystem. Again, natural selection in terms of biodiversity. Definitely going to get a question about this. Okay, so what did this separation of oh, two species, well, the separation of this one species into two different species do? to biodiversity. Increased it, decreased it, kept, left it the same? Decreased it. How did it decrease it? Hmm. So you start off with one species, but then you have two. Two. So that means it increased biodiversity. Yeah. Okay, so biodiversity is the number of different species that we have. Okay, so you started off with one and then it diverged into two different species. So natural selection caused an increase in speciation, which increases biodiversity. You with me? Do you understand that? Okay. Okay, so it was discovered that species A and B were two separate species. Describe what can be done to confirm that the squirrels belong to two different biological species. Okay, so how do we know that things are that that organisms are from one or two species? How can we tell? They have to be able to interbreed. Okay, they have to have a certain amount of genetic variation in their genome. Okay, what else can you tell me about different species? They have to produce fertile offspring. Okay, so if we allow species A to interbreed with species B, then we need to be able to check their offspring and check if they produce viable offspring or fertile offspring. 
And if they do, then they are termed to be the same biological species. But if they produce uh, sterile offspring or they are unable to interbreed, then we can definitely say those are two different species. Alternatively, we can use go the genetic route and uh, analyze their genome. And if there's a greater than 2% difference in their genetic uh, code, then they are regarded as two separate species. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? You can just give me a thumbs up or just shout yes or no. This is a very basic question you, you're likely to get asked. So I started with this. Okay, so see, just gauge whether you know, you can manage these type of questions. And if not, then you need to put stars next to topics like uh, speciation um, and species, what constitutes a species, okay? And uh, geographical barriers, that type of thing. You need to devise that if you are uncomfortable with any of these questions, okay? Let's move on. Okay, scientists use fossils as evidence for human evolution. The brain volume of some extinct primates were estimated from their fossils and have been compared to the brain volumes of living primates. So from this list, which are the living primates? Homo sapiens and modern Correct. apes. Correct, and modern apes, because we can see they are still, they, the period of existence is to the present, okay? So apart from fossil evidence, give two other types of evidence for human evolution. You will definitely be asked this. Evidence for evolution. Tell me all the evidence for evolution, for human evolution. Genetics. Okay, what about genetics? Um, the actual sequence of the genes, okay? So that is correct, yes. Genetics, what other type of evidence for human evolution? Bio bi uh... Bio You're almost there. <laughs> What's the word? Biogeography. Biogeography. Okay, so that means that you're going to find common organisms in different parts of the world, in neighboring continents. Okay, and while we're talking about it, what other what other evidence for evolution? Homologous structures. Yes, and what what would you term that? evidence that is called modification by descent Almost. so we can see that uh, there we share some homologous structures um, amongst our primates okay so there are homologous structures that are common between uh, amongst these different primates. So that is the modification of descent as an evidence for uh, evolution. Okay, so you must know the, you must know, sorry about that. So you must know the following evidences for evolution, the fossil record, the modifi modification by descent, biogeography, and genetics. Okay. You must be able to ex explain those four evidences. Okay, so which primate became extinct first? Obviously, the one that was, that existed many millions of years ago, the most number of millions of years ago. It is? Ardipithecus ramidus. Okay. So you're mostly going to be asked on these three genera, Ardipithecus, sorry, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, and Homo. 
Okay. So those are those three genera that you must know and will come up in, definitely come up in some evolution question. Okay, um, the brain of an organism is not preserved as a fossil. How do scientists determine the brain volume of extinct primates? What do you think? Obviously, this was millions of skull. the size of the skull. Okay, so the cranial volume. Okay, so the inside of the skull, where the brain is housed, the volume of that cranium, the volume that it can hold, that is an indication of the average of the brain volume of that primate. Okay. So I'll just write here for you cranial volume. Okay. Calculate the difference in brain volume in centimeters cubed between the two living primates. Show your calculations and easy to marks. The living primates are Homo sapiens and modern apes. So what's the difference between 1,400 and 500? 900. And don't forget your units, centimeters cubed. Okay, and then you get your two marks very easily. Don't lose marks like like that by forgetting to put centimeters cubed okay because you'll lose that a half a mark or so for that okay so it says show all working so you can get an easy two marks there give evidence in the table that suggests that homo habilis and homo erectus may have existed at the same time okay so you're going to look at the period of existence for homo erectus and homo habilis you can see that there period of existence overlaps. Okay, so then that means they obviously existed around the same time. Yeah. Ardipithecus was the most primitive of all the primate genera. Draw a bar graph to show the average brain volume of each of the species in the genus Homo. So this is for six marks. So you need to make sure that you are able to draw a bar graph. You're definitely going to be asked to draw some sort of graph or table in this paper. Again, it's a simple bar graph. So what's going to be on your x-axis, your independent variables. So that is these actually you're going to have a bar representing each of these Homo species. Okay, you're going to have a bar representing each of these homo species and then the average brain volume of each of them. Okay, very simple. You need to make sure that you have a figure title. Where does this title go? Top or bottom? Top. Incorrect. Top. Incorrect. Okay. It goes at the bottom. Okay, so figure titles go at the bottom of the graph. Table titles go on the top. Think of table top. top. All right. Okay, so table top, the title goes on the top of a table. But in a figure, it's going to go at the bottom. Okay, so you're going to have a figure title. You're going to label your axes. Okay. then you're going to make sure you label the actual bars with the uh, independent variables, which are homo habilis, erectus, neanderthalus, neanderthalensis, and sapiens, okay? And also you're gonna label your y-axis with these numbers. You're gonna make sure you're, you give your y-axis a title, which is average brain volume. already wrote that label axis okay and then you can make sure that it's going up in increments probably of um 500 or so okay so that should be your full six marks okay so your figure title must be descriptive it must tell you exactly what your graph is representing it's a bar graph showing different um 
uh, homo species in terms of average brain volume, showing the average brain volume of different homo species. Okay, don't forget your units. Okay, label axes and units. You get a half a mark for that, for those units there. So you must put in your centimeters cubed when you're labeling your y-axis. Okay. Okay, so those are things to remember for drawing a bar graph. Don't lose those easy marks. All right. Okay. So now, next question. Describe, oh, the diagram sh below show the upper jaws of some fossils. These diagrams are drawn to scale. Okay, so that means they are in the correct proportions to each other. Okay. I'm just getting some feedback from somewhere. Okay. Okay, so describe one visible difference between the jaw of a chimpanzee and that of Homo sapiens, which shows a trend in human evolution. So we're comparing the chimpanzee and the Homo sapien. There's a big difference there. Can, can you give me some differences? Definitely one is bigger and one is smaller. Remember they drawn to scale. So the chimp is bigger. Has a bigger jaw, has canines, large canines, okay, which we don't have. And what else can you tell me? The the jaws are circular compared to the other ones. It's more the 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 human jaw is more circular. Very good. So the shape of the jaw. Okay, so the chimp is looks a bit rectangular, hey, compared to the Homo sapien jaw, which is more rounded. Okay. 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 So they just asked you for one. So any one of those. Okay. Based on the differences in dentition, what conclusion can be made about the change in diet from Australopithecus afarensis? to homo sapiens. So if you look at the second jaw and the human jaw, what do you think is the difference in diet? So you, you're supposed to sort of know the diet of Australopithecus. Australopithecus, they ate yeah. uh, raw food. Very good, okay. So they ate raw food. So their jaw was much more adapted to eating raw so food, whereas homo sapiens eat cooked food. Okay, so you can see that their jaw is much bigger. There's bigger molars. Obviously, you need more chewing power if you're eating raw food. Okay. Then Australopithecus may be described as a transitional species between the chimpanzee and Homo sapiens. This is very important. You must be able to define and identify a transitional species. They can also phrase this question, uh, why was Australopithecus, the discovery of Australopithecus afarensis important? Some vague question like that. And then you must know, okay, it was probably a transitional species based on this dentition. It looks like a transitional species between the chimpanzee and Homo sapien. So what is a transitional species? Anybody? What, what does the word transition mean? It's changing from one thing to another. So what, what is a transitional species? A species are changed from eating raw food, cooked food. Okay, but now don't be so specific here yeah, because it's just telling you to define a transitional species. So yes, you've given me an example, but what is the broad definition of a transitional species. It's a species that has characteristics of its most recent ancestor and its most recent uh, derived um, species. Okay, so 
a species before Australopithecus and a species after Australopithecus. It has characteristics of both. Are you with me? So it has Australopithecus afarensis has characteristics of the chimpanzee, its ancestor, and it Australopithecus has some characteristics of Homo sapiens. The we, Homo sapiens derived their characteristics from Australopithecus. Australopithecus. Are you with me? So it is a transition or an intermediate species. Okay. Are you with me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so a transitional species shows intermediate characteristics between two genera. Okay. Is there for you. Okay, now use one visible feature of the jaw to explain why A. afarensis may be described as a transitional species. So, what visible characteristic? So, I've given you a few. The actual the canines are slightly bigger on Australopithecus. It's slightly bigger than Homo sapiens, but smaller than the chimp. The jaw size is in between that of the chimp and the Homo sapien. And the palate actually looks a bit different. So you can see a completely uh, sort of rectangular palate there. And this is sort of getting a bit rounded here. And you can see that it's broken up in the middle here. Whereas Homo sapiens have a completely oval shape uh, palette. Okay, so the palette shape is in between the two genera. Okay, so you could have said any one of those three visible features. Okay. Okay, so next question. There are two variations in the color of king snakes. Some have bright colorful patterns and others have a dull pattern. King snakes are non-poisonous to their predators. However, coral snakes also have a bright pattern, but they are poisonous to their predators. So king snakes use this as a defense mechanism because predators avoid the colorful king snake because they think it's a coral snake. Okay. So scientists observed that king snakes shared the same habitat with coral snakes. There were more king snakes that had bright, colorful patterns. The diagram below shows uh, represents the distribution of these snakes. So wherever there's these uh, circles, that is your coral snakes, and the colored in triangles are your bright king king snakes, and excuse me, the plain triangles are your clear. Uh, sorry, the clear triangles are your dull king snakes. Okay, so definitely you can see there's a, a more, there's a, an abundance of bright king snakes. And why do you think that is true? Okay, that is definitely going to be a question. So explain how the bright color pattern of coral snakes influences their survival. Okay, so the fact that they are bright, all brightly colored animals, even frogs, uh, snakes, lizards, even some fish. Okay, they have these bright color patterns and most of them are actually poisonous. So that bright pattern, that bright color is a signal to any predators that to say, you know, don't eat me, I am going to kill you. <laughs> so that is a defense mechanism for these organisms. Okay, so in this case, the coral snake has a bright color pattern and it is poisonous to its predators. Okay, so that indicates, the color pattern indicates poisonous, uh, indicates that it is poisonous. And because of that warning signal that the coral snake is giving to its predators, predators are less likely to 
actually eat it. Okay, so it decreases predation and that obviously increases survival of the, of the coral snake. Now, in turn, because the, the bright king snake is mimicking the coral snake in terms of its color pattern, it's also going to benefit from that warning signal from predators who think, okay, this king snake is actually a coral snake. So let me not eat it because they have the same bright color. Okay, are you with me? Yes or no? Just give me a thumbs up. Yes, ma'am. Right. So use Darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection to explain why there are more brightly colored king snakes in this habitat. Okay, so we've just alluded to it in the previous question. If there is less predation, okay, because there's this uh, mimicry of bright colors from the king snake, if there's less predation, it means the bright king snakes are going to survive. The dull king snakes are going to get eaten because predators know, okay, this snake that's brown is not poisonous. So those individuals are going to be eaten. They will die. They will not be able to pass on or interbreed and pass on their genetic information to the next generation, okay? Whereas the bright king snakes who are surviving because of this mechanism of, of mimicry, they are surviving and their population will increase and they will be able to breed and pass that allele for bright color onto the next generation. They'll be able to survive and reproduce and pass on that allele to the next generation, the allele for bright color. Okay, so that gives them, in, you have to explain this in terms of natural selection, remember? So that, that mutation or that allele for bright color has given them an advantage, a survival advantage over the dull snakes. So such that it allows them to uh, avoid predation, survive, reproduce, pass on that bright color allele to the next generation. Okay, are you with me? That is how you need to be able to explain this type of question. You must think about it in terms of natural selection. What advantage is that mutation or that difference giving that organism? Okay, what advantage is it giving to enhance survival? If something is gonna survive, it is going to be able to reproduce and pass on those genes to the next generation. And eventually that will become the dominant uh, characteristics in a population. And the dull king snakes may actually just die off because they are busy being eaten by predators. You with me? Is everybody okay with that? Do you understand that concept? Yes, ma'am. Very good. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. The E. coli bacterium lives in the intestines of pigs where they reproduce rapidly. Certain strains of E. coli cause diarrhea in young pigs or piglets. Scientists carried out an investigation using 100 piglets to determine the resistance of E. coli to two antibiotics. Okay, so let's see how they did this. The scientists injected the piglets with antibiotic A and B, so two different antibiotics. They took a sample of E. coli from the intestines of each piglet a week later and placed them in separate petri dishes allow the bacteria to grow for 24 hours, added antibiotic A to one Petri dish and antibiotic B to the other Petri dish. Okay. Uh, then they measured the growth of bacteria in each Petri dish after 24 hours. They used the growth measurement as an indication of the resistance of the bacteria to each antibiotic. Okay. Repeated, they repeated this process over a period of six months. Then they calculated the average percentage resistance to both antibiotics. 
Okay. So in this graph, this is the graph of their results. Okay. So over time in months, they measure the antibiotic resistance. So if something is resistant, it means it survived. Okay. So if, uh, those, the E. coli that were uh, resistant to antibiotic B, and this is the E. coli that was resistant to antibiotic A. Okay. You are definitely going to get a question regarding something like this, because it is one of the major themes of this evolutionary evolution section. Um, let me just see what it is called so that you know. Um, evolution in present times. It's an example of evolution in present times. Okay, so you are likely to get a question on this. It can be antibiotic resistance, uh, HIV resistance to antiretrovirals. Uh, it could be an example of malaria, uh, how malaria is resistant to treatment. Insecticide resistance. So ag in terms of agriculture, okay, those are examples of evolution in present time. So you are likely to get some sort of a question that's similar to this, and it will be in terms of an experiment. Okay, so you must be able to read and understand a, an experiment on its own. Okay, so application of this, it's gonna come in an application question. Okay. So this is the question here. Yeah, let's look at the, what they ask you about it. Okay. So identify the independent variable in this investigation. Again, just like in paper one, you must know your scientific method. What is the independent variable in this investigation? Anybody can tell me? Hello? Antibiotic resistance. The independent variable. So the thing and that we are not measuring. Mm. Remember the dependent variable is the thing that we are going to be measuring. Student said time. And, okay. Time. All right, that is also correct. Okay. Can you still see my screen, by the way? Uh, okay, I hope so. Okay. Time is is a variable that was that was kept controlled, but it's not the actual independent variable of this investigation. It, it was a it was set over time it is one of the variables but the independent variable is the actual antibiotic a or antibiotic b okay it's your treatments okay so another another term for your independent variable will be your treatments okay so you had treatment a and treatment b in this case antibiotic a and antibiotic b and then you are measuring the antibiotic resistance in response to these treatments okay so the the antibiotic resistance was dependent on the treatment of antibiotic a and antibiotic b okay so antibiotic resistance is your dependent variable and the type of antibiotic would be your uh, independent variable. Okay. Okay. Identify two factors that should be kept constant during the investigation. Okay, I've given you a few, but there's quite a number of them that you that you should keep constant. So things that you should keep constant in an experiment are those. Uh, factors that can actually influence your experiment. They can actually affect the results of the experiment. 
case. So the amount of antibiotic that, that is administered administered to the petri dishes, the concentration of that antibiotic, okay, the number of piglets in this experiment, uh, the concentration of E. coli. Okay, so there was three sort of main things that should main areas where you you could keep things constant that would be regarding the antibiotic then regarding the pigs themselves then regarding the actual e coli that you are that you are uh, measuring okay so there was quite a diver diverse number of factors that should have been kept constant in this experiment okay so that like amount of antibiotic concentration of it the time that you actually administered the initial injection of the antibiotic Okay, they all have to be the same for all the piglets. Then the age of the piglets, the species of them, their, their weight or their mass, because obviously uh, the amount of antibiotic is going to be in relation to their weight. Okay, then in terms of E. coli, you have to, you would probably have to keep the sample size of E. coli the same, uh, the growth medium that you grew the E. coli on in the petri dishes. And also you've got to keep, you got to try to minimize human error. So the, the person doing the measurements needed to be um, the same for each of the groups and the time interval that measurements were taken. Okay. So there's quite a number of factors that you could keep constant in an investigation. They always try to minimize your human error uh, and minimize bias. Okay, so you're always trying to keep things that can affect the results of the experiment. You are trying to keep them the same amongst the groups, okay, or amongst the treatments. Okay, so which antibiotic? Oh, sorry. State two ways in which the scientists ensured the reliability of the investigation. You're also definitely going to get a question regarding validity or reliability of an investigation. Now, the reliability of an investigation is regarding the actual data that you're going to get as your results. Are they uh, all similar? Are you going? To, are you getting? If you're getting big uh, outliers or or results that are not within a certain range, okay? Uh, if you get let's say you get 100 results and 20 of them are way off from the other 80. Those are referred to as your outliers, okay? So that means your mm. results are not so reliable because your data should fall within a certain range. And that the smaller the range, the more reliable that data is, okay? In terms of validity of, a, of an investigation, they could ask you, how do you keep a an investigation valid, that has to do more with the actual design of the experiment. Are the results an a true indication of the, the expected result of, of the experiment? Okay, so do your results answer the question basically? Okay, so that is what validity is. But reliability is the actual spread of the data the the data that you receive from after doing the experiment are they all within a good range and do you have any large outliers okay if you have large outliers it's going to mean that your reliability is questionable okay so state two ways in which the scientists ensure the reliability of this investigation definitely one way to increase reliability is Increase sample size. Very good. Large sample size. And, and what's another one? Repeat the investigation. Very good. Repeat the investigation. Okay. Multiple times, a minimum of three times. Okay. So which antibiotic will you recommend for controlling E. coli in piglets? Let's look at the graph. Which one would you recommend? Antibiotic A or antibiotic B? Antibiotic A. 
antibiotic A. Why? Because it's forty percent resistant. So is resistance a good thing? No. <laughs> exactly. Resistance is a bad thing. We don't want the E. coli to be resistant to the antibody because that means we can't kill the E. coli. The E. coli have mutated and become resistant to that antibody. Okay, so we actually prefer antibiotic B because the E. coli are less resistant, which means we can kill them off if they are causing the piglet to get diarrhea. We can kill them off with antibiotic B and help the piglet. If we give them antibiotic A, the piglet's still going to have diarrhea because, because the E. coli is actually resistant to antibiotic A. Are you with me? So we're yeah. actually trying to, to we're actually trying to find an antibiotic that has the lowest resistance to the target strain. Okay. Is everybody understanding that? It's actually it's like the opposite way that you would normally think about it. In in you may have thought about it in terms of effectiveness, but it was too effective so that, so the E. coli mutated and got a way around this antibiotic, okay? So the antibiotic became ineffective. Remember the function of an antibiotic is to kill the E. coli, to kill the, the bacteria. In general, it's an antibiotic. So you want to kill the bacteria if you give something an antibiotic. So if it is resistant, that means the antibiotic is can't, not doing its job. You're going to have an overgrowth of E. coli or whatever bacteria. And that means the poor piglet is going to have diarrhea. Okay, does everybody understand that? Do you want me to explain that again or are you okay? Okay, miss. All right. Okay, so uh, okay, so if you we sh so we said antibiotic B and support your answer using evidence from the graph. Okay, you would say that antibiotic resistance is much lower in uh, for antibiotic B, and you can maybe quote ten percent to a maximum of 23% resistant. Whereas antibiotic A is 25 to 40% resistant. So we would most prefer to use antibiotic B because it has less resistance. The, the E. coli has less resistance to that antibiotic. So it, another way of phrasing it is that E. coli is more susceptible to antibiotic B. Okay, susceptible means it is, it can be killed, it can be affected, it can be influenced by administration of antibiotic B. Okay, so susceptible means it's, it is affected. And we want the E. coli or any bacteria to be affected by an antibiotic. Okay. Explain the results that are shown in the graph for antibiotic A in terms of natural selection. There was variation in the population of E. coli. Okay, so explain the results that are shown in the graph for antibiotic A in terms of natural selection. Okay, so you need to know uh, a bit of theory behind it, okay? How does antibiotic resistance come about? Okay, can anybody tell me? How does a bacteria, how does a population of bacteria become resistant? 
when there's variation of what of the bacteria okay and what does that variation do it allows them to survive okay keep going mm. Then it allows them, so it's allowing them to survive, which means what? They're going to reproduce. Oh. Okay, that you're on the right track there. Okay, so in terms of antibiotic A, okay, some of that E. coli had, um, had the ability to resist that antibiotic. There were some individuals in the population. There was this variation you were talking about. There were some E. coli in this population were different and they were able to resist antibiotic A. So if they could resist antibiotic A, that means they did not die from it, which means they survived, which means they were able to reproduce. Okay, and because they were able to reproduce, they passed on those alleles for resistance to their offspring. So over time, the resistance to antibiotic A increased and the percentage of E. coli dying from uh, antibiotic A decreased because there was more individuals with that allele for resistance in the population because the ones that were susceptible to antibiotic A, they died. So that means you've got an increase of antibiotic resistant bacteria and a decrease in antibiotic susceptible bacteria. Okay, and this type of question is like for five marks, but can you see again, it's asking you in terms of natural selection. Okay, is everybody okay with that? Do you need me to explain anything further? No, ma'am. All right. Okay, so that is an important question that's, that's you must be able to understand and explain. Everything is going to be asked in terms of, in terms of a the theory of natural selection like you need to understand that mechanism okay as i said before natural selection will give an organism or that organism has that advantage that will favor it it will favor its survival because they have this mutation or this variation okay in their genome and that will, if it's favoring it, it's gonna allow it to survive. And if it survives, it's gonna reproduce and pass on that gene to the next generation. Eventually, over time, that, that, uh, that type of organism will be the dominant vari variation in that population because the ones who did not have that favorable gene, they died off, so they could not reproduce and pass on their allele to the next generation. Okay, so I'm, we, we, you're gonna hear that over and over and you must be able to explain that. Okay, so next question. Tabulate three observable differences between skull one and skull two that show trends in human evolution. Okay, so if you look at skull one and skull two, one is definitely more elongated Okay, one is more rounded. Okay, so that is the, the actual sort of biggest thing that I can see. Okay, sorry, but let me start with this. Tabulate, tabulate three observable differences. So for seven marks, so you're gonna have one mark for the table. Okay, and then probably two marks for each of your three observable differences, okay? So tabulate means you're gonna put it in the table, you're gonna say skull one, skull two, okay? In your two columns, 
and then the heading goes on top of the table. Okay, think table top. So heading goes on top of the table. What does your heading say? Table one, differences between skull one and skull two. Okay, you must have a title. Then in your actual table, you can say, okay, we're talking about brow ridge first. In skull one, the brow ridge is prominent. In skull two, it is diminished. Then the jaw, the, the, it looks like there's a definite difference between the jaws here. Skull one has a protruding jaw or a very prominent jaw, whereas skull two has a diminished jaw or a, or a non-protruding jaw. Okay. Skull one has, let's look at face shape. Skull one has a sloped face. You can see there, there's like a different outward slope for the skull, whereas skull two has a non-sloping face. It's, or it's more of a straight face, okay? Uh, also a major difference I can see is cranium size, okay? So look at this part where the brain goes. The cranium is much smaller in skull one compared to this big section here where the cranium goes, uh, where the brain goes. So the cranium is much larger in skull two. Okay, so that is how you can compare the differences. Remember, if they ask you to uh, compare and contrast, you are giving similarities and differences. Okay. If they just said observable differences, then you know, okay, what is different between them and not what is similar. Okay, so give four characteristics of the upper limbs that humans share with other primates. Okay, so this is also something that you could just learn off. Uh, it actually doesn't have anything to do with, not much to do with the skull that's given to you in the pictures there, but obviously something you had to learn. Okay, so what can you tell me about the upper limbs? that humans share with other primates. Okay, so this is, this is asking you to explain a bit about that modification by descent. So it's an evidence for evolution. So modification by descent and the upper limb is something that's a part of an organism that's um, used to show that descent. Okay, anybody? Bipedalism. Okay, but now we're thinking only of upper limbs, which means like your arms from your shoulder to your fingers. Okay, so your upper limbs. Okay. So what four characteristics of the, of the upper limbs humans share with other primates? Okay, so this is something, I guess, I don't know if you have it in your study guide, but, or in your notes of some sort, but it is something you're just gonna have to learn off. But think about, think, think about chimpanzees. They have arms that look like ours, okay? They have opposable thumbs, they have, freely rotating arms, like we can rotate our arms 360 degrees. So can chimpanzees, okay? Because they have to swing off trees and stuff, okay? So we have similar upper limbs to our, uh, to other primates. So we have opposable thumbs. We have a freely rotating arms, okay? We can also rotate our joints at the elbow, okay? There's a there's an elbow joint. And we have fingertips. We have nails instead of claws. Okay, if we compare that to, for example, a, a mole, okay? A mole actually has claws. So other mammals, okay, or any other, even a horse, a horse has a hoof, okay? We don't share a common characteristic of, an, of the upper limb with the horse, we don't share that common characteristic. But with the 
other primates, we have actual fingernails instead of claws. And we have five fingers. So we have pentadactyl, we have a pentadactyl limb. So pent mean, penta means five. So if we have five fingers or phalanges, and we have finger fingerprints present, okay? So other organisms do not have such a thing, okay? We have fingerprints. And that is common to uh, some other primates. Okay, so this, this you might have to check in the textbook or something if you don't have it in your notes, okay? But it is a theme in, in the evolution section under um, modification of descent. Okay, explain how an increase in cranial volume is related to intelligence. So cranial volume is the size of this part of the skull that houses the brain, okay? So if there's a bigger cranial volume, it means it can accommodate a larger brain. So a larger brain will have more brain cells, which means that organism will be more intelligent or have more cognitive function. Okay, so you have to state this in a logical way. So a larger cranial volume will accommodate a larger brain, which means there's more brain cells, which allows greater cognitive function, which is intelligence. Okay, for three marks. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so humans are bipedal organisms. What is meant by bipedalism? You must know this, it's very easy. Let's get two marks. Answer for bipedalism? Um, they walk on two feet. Yes, okay, so it is the ability to walk on two limbs. Okay. and be able to walk upright. Okay. Explain each of the following skeletal structures. Explain how each of the following skeletal structures have contributed to bipedalism in humans. The foramen magnum, which, what is the foramen magnum? It's where the spine goes into the skull okay that little hole just and at the bottom of the skull okay and that allows for a vertical spine position so that means our backs are our spines are vertical so that means we can stand up straight we can stand up in a vertical position okay that enables us to be bipedal then the pelvic girdle that's your hips they are wider to support the upper body, the, the width of the upper body. Chimpanzees have a very have a very narrow waist. I don't know if you've noticed, ever noticed that. Chimpanzees have a much narrower pelvic girdle because they don't they, their upper body can be bent forward and they can rest their upper body on their forearms. Okay, so they they are adapted to more uh, not walking in an upright manner, okay? So they have a sort of narrower pelvic girdle. Then your spine, how is that uh, adapted? It is, in humans, it's S-shaped. So not, I wouldn't say very S-shaped, but it's straight and it's got a slight curve at the bottom, okay? So they just termed it S-shaped for shock absorption and flexible movement. Okay, so we can move our, our spine and our hips in, in a sort of rotatory fashion. Okay, so we can actually, we actually have much more 
flexible movement because of the shape of our spine. And that, that curve at the bottom of our spine allows for shock absorption as we walk on two limbs. Okay. Then describe the process of speciation through geographical isolation. Okay, so this was just a random question on its own. Okay, and it was for six marks. So this is a must, you must be able to explain this. Okay, so what is geographic isolation? It is the presence of a physical barrier that separates uh, a population of a particular species. Okay. So for example, like we saw in our first question, a river, okay? It was separating those two species of uh, squirrel. Okay, so this is a uh, actual barrier that prevents whatever is on one side from going over to the other side, okay? For example, an ocean prevents organisms from Australia randomly walking into Durban. Okay, because there's a big ocean in between. Okay, so there's a big physical barrier, a geographical barrier. Okay, so because of this barrier, the population on one side of the barrier cannot intermingle with the population on the other side. So there is no gene flow between the separate populations. They are not in contact with each other. Okay, so obviously natural selection will occur independently on each side of this barrier. So on the one side of the river, the squirrels um, under, underwent natural selection and they, they uh, survived on that one side of the river. And on the other side of the river, there was another population that was undergoing natural selection independently, okay? which means that they are not influenced by the other population on the other side of the river. Okay, so due to exposure of different environmental conditions. Okay, so on the one side of the river, there was a certain type of food. On the other side of the river, there was a certain type of food. So there was exposure to different environmental conditions for each of those populations, which means there was different selection pressures. So different selection pressures on either side of the river. So one population was influenced by certain selection pressures and the other population was influenced by different selection pressures, okay? Which drove natural selection in a certain direction. It drove natural sel selection to be able to adapt to the selection pressures on one side of the river and the selection pressures on the other side of the river which are different, okay? So the populations then became different from each other. They diverged because they had to, the, the organisms had to adapt to those different selection pressures, those different environments on either side of the river, okay? So those organisms that were well adapted, that had some sort of variation and were adapted to those different conditions, they were going to be able to survive okay and if they are going to survive they can interbreed and then they can pass on that variation to the next generation okay so they may have genotypic or phenotypic uh, adaptations to those environmental conditions on either side of that barrier of the river in this case okay so even if the populations were to mix again now if let's say that river dried up and they could walk across, because they've diverged from each other in terms of their genotype and their phenotype, because they were isolated for so long that they have their genetic characteristics diverged from each other. Even if those pop if those two populations were to mix again, they will not be able to interbreed. Okay, now we have resulted with two different populations and they are new species. Okay, so it, we're going right up to the level of new species because the question says, describe the process of speciation. So now we're resulting in two species from one initial species. Okay. 
I don't know what you mean by. Hey Siri, we going right? Sorry, I don't know why that was doing something. Okay. Okay, so does everybody understand that concept of geographic isolation? Yes, ma'am. Can you please show us where they mark, like where you where you get marks, those six marks? Okay, so do you see these tiny icons? I don't know why it didn't paste as ticks, but these are supposed to be your ticks. Okay, so each little bullet point is a is a mark. Can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Okay, so jot that down. You must be able to explain genetic isolation. Now, there's two. The, the, what's the alternative to genetic isolation? Or what's the word I'm looking for? Another mechanism of speciation. Remember, genetic isolation. Is, as, is also, what's another word for genetic isolation? Geographic. Sorry, for geographic isolation. It's called allopatric. Oh. Allopatric speciation. So they may even use that term, okay? What's another mechanism for speciation? It is reproductive isolation, okay? And that is termed sympatric speciation, okay? So just revise that. You've got geographical isolation. Oh, wait, I might have a question for you if, uh, about that. Okay, let me, let me carry on. But revise genetic isolation. Well, sorry, I keep saying genetic. Geographical isolation and reproductive isolation. Okay, so your allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Those two mechanisms are what's going to cause new species to occur. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's move a bit faster. So a gene mutation, okay, sorry. Uh, this paragraph tells you about a Tibetan population that were able to survive at high temperatures. Okay, it is possible to cope with low oxygen at at content at high altitudes. Sorry, I said temperatures by mistake. It's altitudes. One way is for the body to produce more red blood cells, so it'll be able to absorb more oxygen. Another way of coping has developed in a, in Tibetans as a result of a gene mutation that is inherited from the ancestors. The, gene, the mutant gene helps them to use the low amount of oxygen more efficiently, okay? So the mutant gene was found in 87% of the Tibetan population, but only in 9% of the Han population that live at lower altitudes, okay? So they live at sort of the bottom of the mountain, this Han population. But another population of Tibetans live high up in high altitudes, and they and eighty seven percent of of that population had this mutant gene that allowed them to use oxygen more efficiently. Okay, so a gene mutation caused by caused variation between the Tibetan population and the Han population. Name three other sources of variation in a human population. Random arrangement of chromosomes. In metaphase okay. one. Yeah. Correct. So it was it's a similar question to what we had uh, when we just started. Okay, so that was that is your crossing over, your um, random assortment, all of those sources of variation. Okay. So again, as you can see, it's quite important. So you should know that. Okay, give evidence in the extract which suggests that the survival of people living at high altitudes could be due to a genetically inherited trait. Evidence from the, from the extract, it says this gene, there was a gene found in 
of them. Okay? Um, give evidence in the extract which suggests that the survival of people living at high altitudes could be caused by an environmental factor. There, were, there is actually low oxygen content in high altitudes. Okay, so that is an environmental factor that now could have influenced the, the adaptability of You're not having um, another one this population. Okay, oh, sorry, this went so small. Okay, uh, describe how, oh, sorry, I missed a few. Uh, the evidence that this was caused by environmental factor, okay, we answered that. Highlighting that for you. Okay, and the next question is, explain the advantage of producing more red blood cells. More red blood cells mean you, means you'll be able to carry more oxygen. Mm. Okay. Three. Three. I don't know, you got, no. Last one. Yeah. Okay. Describe how Lamarck would have explained the survival of Tibetans at high altitudes. Okay, so this is something, a concept that you should know. They likely to ask you the, just the theory about Lamarckism, okay? And you have to compare it to natural selection and also uh, punctuated equilibrium. Okay, so what, what, is, what did Lamarck, come up with. He was a very primitive evolutionary biologist. Okay. So he was, he came up with one of the first theories about it. Okay. And he uh, made two laws. What were the two laws? The law of use and disuse. And? Uh, law of, of uh, in genetics. No. Law of inheritance of acquired characteristics. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about in term in this in this example. Okay, so originally the amount of red blood cells was similar in all of the humans in that whole population of Tibetans. Okay, they the Tibetans were normal, but when they started living in these conditions, okay, so as a result of the low oxygen content that they were living in, in that high altitude, the red blood cells tried to increase the amount of oxygen absorbed. Okay, so as a result, so they acquired, so the, the, the theory of, of Lamarck's first law is that they acquired this characteristic, which resulted in them having more red blood cells. Okay, so they either acquired this characteristic of having more red blood cells and or they developed ways of using oxygen more efficiently, but it was an acquired characteristic, okay? However, just remember that an acquired characteristic cannot be passed on to the next generation because it's not genetic. But in this case, they said that they did have a gene that was found that could use oxygen more efficiently, okay? so in terms of that actual gene, then you can talk about natural selection. But the acquired characteristic of having more red blood cells or developing more red blood cells because they were at increased oxygen levels is not uh, a permanent uh, change in, in that species. Okay, so if, for example, any runner can actually uh, go to another population uh, sorry, another area, and uh, if they are running at high altitudes, for example, they can just acclimatize themselves in that area for a certain amount of time, and they will also develop a bit more red blood cells. 
to be able to cope with that low oxygen level. Okay, so they are acquiring that characteristic by being in that environment. Okay, so as a result, Tibetans produce more red blood cells by being in this environment um, to increase the availability of oxygen to the body. Okay, as we said, it's an acquired characteristic. And then Lamarck would have said that this was then passed to their offspring. And that is now how all Tibetans produce more red blood cells and use oxygen more efficiently at high altitudes. Okay, so that is the whole flaw in his argument. But that's what the question asked. Describe how Lamarck would have explained the survival of Tibetans. Okay, we now know that Lamarck's laws were disproved. Okay, and rejected. Okay. Next question. Scientists compare the number of differences in amino acid sequence to see how long, to see how closely related species are. Fewer differences in the amino acid sequence mean the species are more closely related. Okay, for example, cytochrome C is a protein that occurs in many species. The amino acid sequence of this protein differs between species. Okay, so the table shows the number of differences in the amino acid sequence of three species A, B, and C. Okay, so they are comparing the differences in amino acid sequence of cytochrome C amongst these three species. Okay, so what type of, and, and then once they've compare that, they put it into this sort of uh, phylogenetic tree, this cladogram here for you. Okay, so there's a common ancestor, and then species A, B, or C were distributed in this cladogram. Okay, so what type of evidence for evolution is being used in this table? What did they do? They looked at amino acid sequence. Okay, so what type of evidence is that? Genetic. Okay, correct. Okay, give a letter, give the letter of the species A, B, and C that should appear at positions one, two, and three in the diagram. Okay, so what does it, you need to be able to, to read a cladogram as well. Okay, so what does uh, this cladogram say? A species, a species at position one is, is most distantly related to species at position number three. Okay, species at position number one and position number two are actually more closely related because there's the node over there. Okay, but all three of them share a common ancestor. Okay, so which species are most different? One and here's, three. Here's the differences, the a number of differences. So which oh. species are most different? You need a. to put A, you need to put A, B, and C here. We're in positions one, two, and three. Okay, so what's what will be what two species are the most different? Species A mm. and B. Okay, mm. so you can put species A at position number one and species B at position number three. Because species, the difference between species A and species C is only three different there's only three differences so they are actually closely related okay so that oh. would be you would put species c at position number two okay so you, it would be a c and b here okay let me write it for you it can be a c and b what other options do we have? 
species B and C are also quite distantly related. So what will our next option be? Um, Jerusha, the students are a bit confused. Can you just go over how you came to the answer? Okay, Thank sure. You. Okay, so what the question is asking is, give the letter of the species A, B, or C that should appear at positions one, two, and three. So this cladogram is showing relatedness, okay? It's the relation between your three species. Okay, and how do we talk, how do we figure out how, if something is related or not? We're gonna see whether something is similar or more different. You're gonna compare them and look at the differences, right? So here's a table of the differences in the amino acid sequence amongst these three species. Are you with me? Yes, yes or no? Right. So, species A and species B, there's 11 differences between their amino acid sequence. So, they are the most different to each other. Are you with me? So, if they're the most different to each other, that means they are mm -hmm. more distantly related. Okay? You're talking about relatedness. Mm -hmm. So, if they are most distantly related, that means they share a common ancestor much further back. So the furthest back we can get is right here. Okay, they share a common ancestor. There are some similarities, but there are differences. Okay, there's species A and species B. So we know there are different species, but they share a common ancestor. So they are they have the most differences. So they have to be, they have to share this node at the latest point, sort of if I can put it that way, okay? So they are most distantly related, okay? So that will be at positions one and positions three, okay? So you could put A at position number one and you could put B at position number three. And we can confirm this because the difference in in the difference between species C and B is only, sorry, C and A is only three spaces, three differences, which means that species mm -hmm. C and species A are closely related to each other, which means they diverged from mm -hmm. each other at a much later point, okay? So at this node here, they diverged, okay? So they, whatever's at position number one and two are actually more closely related than mm -hmm. uh, what than the organism that's at position number one and three. Okay, so this these two are more closely related because they share a common ancestor much, much more recently, okay? So, C will be at position number two because they, sh uh, because species A and species C only share three differences between them. But species B and species A share 11 differences between them. So they diverged much oh. earlier on. Much oh. earlier on. Okay? From their common ancestor. Is that a bit more understandable? Is, is yes. that a bit better? Okay, so you gotta uh, you gotta be able to to read off a cladogram. In this case, they asked you to actually put stuff into a cladogram, but you need to be able to uh, read off the cladogram and understand what it means in terms of relatedness. Okay, that is a major a major thing about in evolution. You need to know about relatedness. Okay, I'm just seeing, okay. They usually will even give you something even for human evolution for relatedness in a cladogram. 
Okay, but you got to be comfortable with that. Okay. Here's another one. Okay. Showing fossil evidence for humans. Okay. And it says that fossil evidence for humans may have in may be interpreted in different ways. One possible model of human evolution is shown below. Okay, so this is a possible diagram of what evolved from what. Okay, so name the family to which all of the represented organisms belong. These are all what? What family would, would Australopithecus and Homo belong? The apes. The family. So if mm -hmm. you ask for family, it, it, that means the word ends in D-A-E. It ends in a day. So in this case, it's hominidae. Okay, that is the family for these organisms, these primates. Okay, so hominidae. That is if you ask for a family name. Then describe how cultural evidence is used to support the theory of human evolution. Okay, so what is cultural evidence? It's used to actually supplement the fossil evidence. Okay, so cultural evidence speaks of how organisms lived. Okay, so, uh, and how does that now support the theory of human evolution? We, you can, we can look at the tools that they used, okay, and other artifacts uh, that were that are associated with where that fossil was found. Okay, so cultural evidence can support the theory of human evolution because maybe there was certain tools like uh, cutting tools or hammering tools that were found near where the uh, skeletons were found. Okay, so we can in infer how those uh, organisms lived and how they changed over time, which is evolution. How long ago did the most recent common ancestor of uh, Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis exist on earth? Okay, so here's heidelbergensis and here's erectus. So where is their common ancestor? Where do you must, Go along these lines till you hit a node. Here's it there. Can you see my cursor? Can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Right. So along this line till you hit a node, along this line till you hit a node, we get to three million years ago. Okay. So that is how long ago the most recent ancestor of these two hominids existed three million years ago. Explain a possible reason why H. agaster was placed between um, afarensis and heidelbergensis. So why is this species in between these two species? This is another way of phrasing a question on transitional species. Why was it placed between these two other species? Because it means it shares some characteristics, oh, sorry. some characteristics from both Australopithecus And I'm just putting, I'm just going to say HHK. I don't have space to type that. Okay, so um, H. agaster shares similar, shares some characteristics with Australopithecus afarensis and with 
Homo heidelbergensis. That's why it is in the middle. It was placed in between these two species because it is a transitional species. Are you with me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Explain how the fossils of organisms that existed from 4 million years ago to the present time are supported by the out of Africa hypothesis. Very important, you need to know what the out of Africa hypothesis is and evidence for that, okay? So explain how the fossils of organisms that existed are used to explain or support the out of Africa hypothesis. Okay, so the fossils Australopithecus are only found in Africa. Homo habilis is also only found in Africa, which means that they originated here. Okay, and then the oldest fossils of Homo erectus and Homo sapiens are found in Africa, which means they originated here and then moved out into other parts of the world. Okay, so that means that the the oldest ancestors of Homo sapiens came from Africa. They came out, they originated in Africa and then moved out into the rest of the world. Okay, so that is your out of Africa hypothesis. Okay, I'm just gonna move a little bit quicker. Got about two more questions to do. Okay, describe the process of natural selection. This is a very broad uh, general question. I mean, this was probably, I think this was from the 2020 paper. So you can easily get your seven marks here. You must know what's natural selection. Okay, organisms produce a large number of offspring and that allows it, those offspring to have variability because of crossing over random assortment random fertilization, random mating. Okay, so there will be variation amongst those offspring. And some of that, some of those variations may actually be favorable characteristics and some may not be favorable characteristics. And those, those favorable characteristics will give those organisms a certain advantage to being, to, to surviving in a certain environment. Okay, so when there is a change in that in, in an environmental condition, or even just that environmental condition, the organisms that have the favorable characteristics will be able to survive. They will outcompete those who do not have those certain favorable characteristics. Okay, then organisms with this favorable characteristics will be able to survive because they've outcompeted the other ones. And if they survive, that means they can reproduce and they can now pass on those favorable characteristics or those variations in the alleles to the next generation. Okay, And obviously those who do not have uh, the favorable characteristics, they are going to die off they are not going to be able to uh, pass on their gene genetic information to the next generation. So the next generation will therefore have a higher proportion of individuals with those favorable characteristics. Okay, and that is how a species changes over time by the process or the mechanism of natural selection. It's the, the population is being selected naturally by the environmental conditions and the, the selection pressures of that environment, okay, that it is in. Okay, you must know that. Okay, one more example, potos and lemurs are small mammals. Scientists believe that potos and lemurs share common ancestor that existed in Africa. Presently, potos only occur in Africa, while lemurs only are uh, only found in Madagascar. Madagascar is an island off the east coast of Africa as shown in the diagram, okay? So you can see this little island here. Explain how continental drift could have affected the distribution of the common ancestor. Okay, so you must know what is continental drift. 
okay that is in your topic of biogeography okay so that is when the world was once one very large continent called pangaea and then over millions of years the continents broke up into into two um laurasia and gondwana that that was your two major sections of continents and uh, from 65 million years ago to today that is how long it took for our world our continents to spread out to the conformation that we see today okay so when pangaea existed there was a common ancestor so even when there was Gondwana existing, there was a common ancestor that lived in southern, the southern hemisphere on this, con on this mega continent of Africa and Australia and Madagascar and all of these little countries. They were all squashed together. Okay, So um, when Madagascar separated, okay, when continental drift occurred, which means that those those tectonic plates shifted, those continents and uh, land masses shifted because the tectonic plates shifted. Madagascar broke away from Africa, okay? And it took with it that species or whichever species, okay? So the common ancestor was found in Africa and Madagascar because they existed as one thing in Gondwana or Pangaea. Okay, so when Madagascar and Africa were stuck together, obviously your common ancestor could walk between the two places. And then continental drift happened where the, the tectonic plates shifted and land masses moved apart and that took with it that common ancestor. Okay. Now, describe the speciation of potos and lemurs to become different species. Okay, so we just explained continent, what continental drift was. Now, <clears throat> what is, how does that affect speciation? For six marks. <clears throat> okay, so that common ancestor became separated by this Indian Ocean. Okay, so there was common ancestor on the east coast of Africa and on and in Madagascar. So we had a geographical barrier between Africa and Madagascar. So now, obviously, the common uh, ancestor uh, diversified or or um, evolved separately from each other. Okay, the one in Africa evolved separately from the one in Madagascar because of this Indian Ocean in between. And it, they could not intermingle. Individuals from Africa couldn't intermingle with those from Madagascar. So there was no gene flow that occurred between the two groups. So they were isolated from each other and underwent natural selection independently and separately from each other based on the conditions that were in Africa, based on the conditions that were in Madagascar. Okay, the selection pressures from Madagascar were different to the selection pressures in Africa. Okay, the individuals in each group became different based on those different selection pressures that now existed between the two places, separated by this geographical barrier. So the organisms in Africa and the organisms in Madagascar became genotypically and phenotypically different from each other as they were undergoing natural selection independently of each other. Okay, so their genotype and their phenotypes became different over time. And that is how we got potos and lemurs. Okay, so maybe, so potos were in Africa and lemurs were in Madagascar, but they originated from the same common ancestor. Okay, so eventually, if the two groups are mixed again, if Madagascar somehow comes into contact with Africa again, or we bring some lemurs over into Africa again, and you mix the, the potters and the lemurs, they would not be able to interbreed, or they would produce fertile offspring if they could interbreed. Okay, they would not be able to produce fertile offspring because they now have become two entirely different species. Okay. 
So I hope that was, is everybody following that explanation? Okay, Speci this, the explanation of speciation by a geographical barrier. Allopatric speciation, does everybody understand that? As you can see, it's coming up quite often in, in these questions. So you must know it, okay? Um, okay, let's do this example. Okay, this is a bit of a long question. Let's try. Okay, male long-tailed window birds have extremely long tail feathers that they use in mating displays, okay? And then a sci scientists conducted an investigation to, to determine the relationship between the length of the male long-tailed window bird's tail and its mating success. So whether if it had a long tail, would it be, would its mating be more successful, okay? So the relationship between the length of the tail and mating success. Okay, a total of 27 male long-tailed widow birds were sampled and divided into uh, short, short cut tail feathers made longer by artificial tail feathers or left unchanged. The three groups of male, male widow birds along with female widow birds were released into an environment for mating. And each time a pair mated successfully, they produced a nest and all the nests were counted. The average number of nests were calculated and used as an indication of mating success. Okay, so in group one, group two, and group three, we have the average number of nests produced. So from this table, what can you tell me? You can see that in group two, there was the highest number of nests uh, formed the highest average number of nests, which means that group two had the highest mating success, okay? And those were the birds that had longer tails by the scientists adding artificial feathers to make those tails very long, okay? So obviously that was very attractive to the females and they mated with these, uh, with these males from group two. Okay, so name the reproductive isolating mechanism that occurs in long-tailed widow birds. So a reproductive isolating mechanism. Okay, so there's, there's a few that you can tell me. So what's the answer to that? Different courtship behavior. Okay, anything else? Different pollinators. Well, uh, well, birds don't pollinate. I mean, sorry, they don't. We're talking about copulation and not pollination. So we're not talking about anything pollinating the birds. We're talking about the birds just mating. So we have. The, the, let's just go over the different types of reproductive uh, isolating mechanisms. You've got breeding at different times of the year, species species courtship behavior, adaptations to different pollinators, prevention of fertilization, and production of infertile offspring in, in cross species hybrids. Okay, so those are your different types of mechanisms for reproductive isolation. So yes, you are correct in saying that it's probably a courtship behavior that is the uh, reproductive isolating mechanism, okay? Then what's the independent variable in this investigation? The group. actual tail, yeah. So what's our treatment? The tail feathers, the groups of different tail feathers, okay? Explain why 27 long-tailed widow birds were used in the investigation instead of three. Why did they use 27? To make the experiment much more? Balance. Reliable, reliable. Okay. If we have more repeats, we have a more reliable experiment. Explain why group three was included in the investigation. What is group Seven. three? Seven. Group three's tails were left unchanged to act as a 
control or a comp to be able to compare okay to see the effect of the artificial addition of tail feathers okay so sort of like a control but it's actually called a positive control okay so again draw a bar graph i'm not going to go through that actually because we we short of time but i've already been through that with you in the previous uh, question so just revise that and then revise how to do the bar graph then state a conclusion for this investigation sorry state a conclusion for this investigation what can we say that Group. males with longer tails had more reproductive success because they were able to produce the greatest average number of nests okay so that's what our results tell us okay so long-tailed birds were more successful at mating. Okay. Okay, so I just compiled some study tips for you, things that you definitely need to know uh, for this particular section. Okay, evidence for evolution, you talk, which means you have four different types of evidences, sources of variation, you're crossing over random mm. assortment, etc. Then you need to know the differences between Lamarckism, uh, natural selection, punctuated equilibrium. Okay, you need to be able to explain the differences between between those uh, theories. Okay, and mechanisms of speciation. Your uh, geographic and reproductive isolation. Okay. Then evolution in present times, for example, your antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the out of Africa hypothesis. You need to know those three genera, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, and Homo. Okay. You're definitely going to get a question of some sort on those. Okay, so those are just, you need to be able to answer questions on each of them because definitely something from each of these three, each of these sections is going to come out. Maybe in, even in multiple choice of matching, but definitely you'll get a question in this, about this. Excuse me. Okay, um, Namisha, do we have any uh, questions in the chat that I could quickly go through? No, no questions in the chat. Okay, uh, Namika, do I have two more minutes? I've just got one last may mitosis meiosis question. Can we go through it? No problem, I'm not in a hurry. Sure. Okay, students. So that was an overview of your, of your evolution uh, type of questions that you'll get. Remember we said in the beginning that uh, another easy section that you should definitely get full marks for is your meiosis questions. Okay, and here's an example of one that I've just taken from last year's um, exam paper, okay? And it's a diagram that shows all the chromosomes in a cell, okay? That is undergoing normal cell division, okay? So immediately, what can you tell from this diagram? Crossing over. Correct, okay? So name the type of cell division that is occurring in the cells in the diagram. What type of cell division occurs? Because you can see crossing. Meiosis. Crossing over is happening. Prophase one. Okay, very good. But it's saying type of cell division. So don't say prophase one. You must say meiosis. Meiosis. That is the, the type of um, cell division. Okay, so now question B what is the phase of cell division during which the chromosomes behave as shown in the diagram? And yes, prophase. young man, you are correct. Prophase oh. one. Okay. Prophase one, very good.
Okay, so where in the human female body would the type of cell division named here take place? Ovary. In the ovary. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Give the letter and name of the structure that attaches to the spindle fibers. Where do the spindle fibers attach in meiosis and mitosis? C. What is that? Centromere. Very good. Okay, so you see these questions are pretty easy. You can just get your, your marks here. Okay. How many chromosomes would be found in each daughter cell at the end of this cell division? Okay, remember the question said something here. This diagram represents all the chromosomes in this particular cell. Okay, so how many chromosomes will be found in each daughter cell at the end of this cell division? Remember, what's our products of meiosis? One cell divided from four cells. What now? One cell divides to become four cells. Okay, so we have we have two divisions in, in meiosis, and that is going to reduce, that is going to increase the number of daughter cells. Okay, so how many chromosomes? I'm talking about in terms of chromosomes, how many chromosomes will be found in each daughter cell at the end of your meiosis in general. Okay. It's going to be half the number of chromosomes than huh? what we started okay. off. Okay. And now how many take up my time? Okay, so how many chromosomes will be found in each daughter cell at the end of this cell division? Forty-six. Okay, students said twenty-three. But remember, the question said in all chromosomes in the diagram. So there's only how many chromosomes do we see here in this diagram? Four. I don't. I don't see forty-six or twenty-three. Cool. There's only three. There's three homologous pairs. Six. Okay. So. Six. How many chromosomes will be found in each daughter cell at the end Three. of the Three. cell division? Okay, so it's going to be half of six, which is Three. Three. Okay. Okay, so don't assume that it's just in human cells. Okay, read the question carefully. It says... The diagram represents all the chromosomes in a cell, in a cell, any random cell. Okay. So whenever you get this type of question, always read the instruction, whether they're telling you it's in a normal human cell, which would be 46 chromosomes, or in the diagram itself. So always count the chromosomes in there and apply your theory on meiosis and mitosis. Yeah. Okay. Um, Namisha, would you like to please um, put up the diagram for the students? Okay. Can you stop sharing so I can share? I'm unable sure. to share over you. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay. So my test is and my Namisha. Okay. So we go with meiosis one, tuition. Okay. Is that we're starting with meiosis one, right? Or mitosis? Yes. Okay. No, we'll start with meiosis one. Okay. So the first half of meiosis, okay, the acronym, you should know this now. What's the acronym for the whole process of meiosis? IPMA. For meiosis, the whole thing of meiosis. Oh, P. IPMAT. IPMAT, MAT. There's two parts of meiosis. Okay, so for the whole process of meiosis, you've got IPMAT, which occurs in meiosis one, and then, then MAT occurs in meiosis two. 
you and me. So it's if match match. For meiosis. In mitosis, you're gonna have if just if match. Okay. So for the first part of meiosis, it is called a reductional division because we have a reduction in the number of chromosomes. Okay. So what can you tell me is the major thing that we need to note in the first division? What happens? Crossing over. Okay, very importantly, crossing over occurs. Okay. And crossing over occurs between what? Two chromatids. Okay, be more specific about the chromatids. Maternal and paternal. Very good. It crossing over occurs between two non-sister chromatids. Okay, so one from the mother and one from the father. It can't be crossing over occurring on, on chromatid, chromatids of the same chromosome. It has to be from different chromosomes. Okay, but the same characteristics are being swapped. The same, uh, different alleles for the same mm -hmm. genes are being swapped. Okay, one from the mother, one from the father. Okay. Okay, so the process of crossing over occurs and and what is that point of crossing over? Chiasma. The chiasma, okay? That's important. Okay, so you end up with genetic variation as a result of crossing over. Okay, and it, it can occur randomly amongst uh oh uh, it's already on the diagram there, Nance. Yes? Okay, so your crossing over can occur but amongst any of your of your genes. Okay, that is how we get all that genetic variation in a population. Okay, then in metaphase one, we've we've got another the introduction of another uh source of variation and that is the random assortment of those chromosomes on the equator of the cell okay so if if they randomly assort on the equator they will randomly end up in one cell or randomly end up in the other cell okay and that now will cause variation as to uh, whether the organism gets the first cell number one or cell number two Okay, whatever genes are in cell number one, whatever genes are in cell number two. Okay, so random assortment introduces that variation, genetic variation into the gametes. Okay. And remember, this is going to take place in the sex cells. So we're talking gametes here. Okay, then anaphase one, again, there's a random segmentation, uh, ran, sorry, random segregation. And that ensures that each gamete only has one allele of each mm. gene. Okay, so those chromosomes are going to be pulled apart to the poles. And you can see that there's some blue chromosomes have a bit of red and some red chromosomes have a bit of blue there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see that genetic, uh, genetic assortment has occurred or crossing over has occurred. Okay. And then we have the process of telophase, telophase one and cytokinesis, where your a cleavage furrow will form in animal cells and in plant cells, what forms? What forms in plant cells instead of a cleavage furrow? Anybody? Mm. Cytokinesis. What? Just repeat that. Cyt. Oh, sorry, Can you're breaking. You're breaking up there. I can't hear you. But uh, in plant cells, you get a cell plate forming. Oh. Sounded like you said that. Okay, so a cell plate forms between the two cells in, in plant cells, okay? Where you, because remember now you need to make that, you need to make the cell a wall again between those two cells. Mm -hmm. So vesicles will bring 
will bring some cellulose yeah, and scary. deposit the cellulose in the middle over there and then all those vesicles will join up together and then you're getting the formation of a cell wall in between those two cells okay and then we have our second division which is meiosis 2 okay and in meiosis 2 this is an equational division it's more like mitosis okay so we're not halving anything so we maintaining that same number of uh, chromosomes and we have now a, a mitotic division or an equational division which means that we are conserving that number of chromosomes but what happens is that the chromatids of those homologous chromosomes are going to separate okay so we've got chromatids being pulled to the poles mm. instead of homologous mm. chromosomes being pulled mm. to the poles like we did in meiosis one okay so we have our prophase again where our nuclear membrane and nucleolus disappear and our centros centrosome um, appears and uh, we have our then we have our spindle fibers attaching to the centromeres Okay, and then in metaphase two, we've got, oh, excuse me, in metaphase two, we've got our um, chromosomes randomly again, aligning on the equator of the cell. Okay, and they're going to be pulled apart. The chromatids from those uh, chromosomes are going to be pulled apart in anaphase 2. You can see chromatids there just being dragged to the poles in each of those daughter cells. See, after meiosis 1, we, we ended up with two daughter cells. Okay, So in each of those daughter cells, it's going to undergo meiosis 2. Okay? So the sister chromatids separate to each of the poles in and Please mute your mics if you are not speaking. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to mute them. It's not working. Okay. So then in telophase two and cytokinesis, again, it's occurring in two of, in those two daughter cells that we had from meiosis one. So if, uh, if each of those daughter cells are dividing into two, our end result of meiosis is four daughter cells. Okay, and you'll have your chromatids uh, condensing again into your genetic, uh, into your DNA structures, and your centrioles will disintegrate. Okay, and you the end result of meiosis is four daughter cells that are genetically different from each other and the parent cell, okay? And they have half the number of Chromosome. uh, chromosomes in each of those cells, okay? So they are termed to be haploid, okay? They have half the number of chromosomes. Okay, is that, that was a quick overview. Um, would you like to add anything, Nymph? Sorry, my mic was muted. Now it's uh, nothing more to add, but just if you guys want, we can just leave the two different mitosis and meiosis so you, as a summary, right? Remember, at the end of mitosis, you have diploid daughter cells. At the end of mitosis, at the end of meiosis two, you have your daughter cells, as uh, Jerusha has been explaining to you, that are haploid, which is assigned by N, while diploid is 2N. So in a normal um, animal cell, right, at the end of mitosis, you're going to have 46 or 23 chromosomes. 46. Right, good. And therefore, in meiosis, you'll be half, which is 23. Okay. Any other questions you may have? 
Okay, and some uh, in the chat, some people ask just for more questions, um, but please join us again tomorrow afternoon. So we have another session tomorrow from 12 o'clock to two o'clock. Okay, where we can, where we'll go through more questions from the, the remaining sections that will be included in your paper two. Okay, so tomorrow from 12 o'clock to 2 p.m. From midday to 2 p.m. You can log on. Okay. All right, Miss. Thank if there's no further questions on meiosis, we no can questions. end our session. Okay. Any any other questions quickly? If you want, you can also email us at life science helpline at ukzn.ac.za and we will reply to your questions. But you can also come tomorrow at from 12 to 2 for our next session. Part of the UKZN experience is the opportunity to be part of a community and to network with not only our world-renowned academics, but with future game changers and leaders. They do say that the extent of one's success can be attributed to those they rub shoulders with. Therefore, you must surround yourself with like-minded people. So, how do you become part of a community that is committed to your self-development? How do you become part of UKZN? First, you have to apply. All applications for undergraduate studies at UKZN are processed through the Central Applications Office, CAO. This is for both your course and student residence application. The application process is as follows. Step 1. Consult the CAO Handbook. This handbook provides a list of all qualifications available at UKZN. Step 2. Have a look through the various courses offered and choose a program that interests you and for which you meet the minimum requirements. As one of the top five universities in the country, UKZN promotes academic excellence. So meeting the minimum requirements does not guarantee you a place to study. Step three, find the program code linked to your chosen qualification. This is the code you need to enter in your application form. Okay, let me show you something. You see, a code has three parts. Example, for BCom in accounting, the code is KN-P-BCN or KN-W-BCN. Crazy code, right? Well, basically, the KN stands for UKZN. The middle part stands for the campus of your choice. P for Peter Maritzburg, W for Westville. Then, BCN stands for the actual course. Make sure to get these codes right. Step 4. Use this program code when completing your CAO form, which is available from the CAO website. Your application will be sent to UKZN. You can always check the status of your application using your CAO number, ID number, or passport number on this website www.caocheck.ukzn.ac.za For more information, visit www.caoac.za It's that easy. Pay close attention to closing dates for qualifications. For example, MBCHB closes on the 30th of June, whilst other undergraduate programs close on the 30th of September. What are you waiting for? Apply now and shape your future today.